I could be red, or I could be yellow, I could be blue, or I could be purple, I could be green or pink or black or white, I could be every color you like. Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Kieran Deepkor, and today I'm going to be focusing on amino acids. So we'll go through the 20 structures, the so corresponding one letter code, the three letter codes, and I'll bring your attention to how amino acids are synthesized in our body. So if that's what you're interested in, keep watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's get started. All right, then let's begin with the basic structure of an amino acid. We have a central carbon connecting a carboxylic group, connecting an amine group, a hydrogen, which is usually not drawn, but you should be aware that it's there. And lastly, the fourth thing is the R group. In acidic conditions, the amine group becomes protonated and becomes positively charged. In basic conditions, the carboxylic groups get deprotonated and becomes negatively charged. So I'm gonna show the structure here. Again, the hydrogen is usually not drawn. And the last thing that we have is the R group. Now, I want you to bring your attention to the fact that this molecule is dipolar. It has two or more functional groups. It has um, at least one positive, one negative. And even though it's charged, the overall, the total charge is actually neutral. And because it's all of these things, it is called a Zwitter ion. Now, this Zwitter ion is actually seen at physiological pH, which is around like 7.2 to 7.4 in the low um, 7 range. So in our body, this is how amino acids exist. But in our textbooks, that's how they're usually shown. Now, I want to bring your attention to what makes every amino acid different. That is the R group. So there are 20 different R groups that you have to memorize, and each has different chemical properties. So it could be nonpolar. It could be polar. It could be polar not charged. Or it could be charged positive or negative. And lastly, it could be aromatic. Now, let's go over what each means. But before we do that, we need to understand what electronegativity is. It is how much an atom pulls shared pair of electrons. For example, hydrogen it is not as electronegative as oxygen. So if there was a bond between hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen will pull electrons to itself because, it, because it's more electronegative. Therefore, this side will be more negative than this side, which will be partially positive. These are called partial charges. Now, if a molecule has polar bonds that are not balancing each other out, that molecule is polar. For example, oxygen which is very polar, is bonded to two hydrogens. This is H2O. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogens. So the electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen. You can tell that this molecule is polar. This side is partially negative and the hydrogens are partially positive. So H2O is a polar molecule. Now, a molecule can have polar bonds, but still be nonpolar. So let's go over an example. CCl4. We have a carbon connected to four chlorine molecules. Now, in order to figure out if the carbon-chlorine bonds are polar or not, we need to look at the electronegativity. And we know that carbon is less electronegative than chlorine. So for each bond, the electrons are being pulled towards the chlorine atoms. Now, what I want you to notice that there is a pull upwards and downwards to the right and to the left. So each pull is actually canceled. Therefore, this molecule 
is nonpolar. A molecule could also be nonpolar if it has only nonpolar bonds. For example, carbon and hydrogen have about the same electronegativity. So when you're looking at a molecule such as CH4, again, carbon connected to four different hydrogens, there is no pull on the electrons. The electrons are equally shared. Therefore, this molecule is another example of a nonpolar molecule. So now we know the difference between nonpolar and polar, but we need to understand how polar molecules could be charged. So similar to how we see here in our Zwitter ion, at certain pHs, functional groups could get deprotonated or protonated, resulting in an extra charge. So when the R group at a certain pH loses or gains an um, I'm sorry, a hydrogen, it becomes charged. So now the next thing we're going to focus on is how a molecule is aromatic. So for a molecule to be aromatic, it has to be cyclic, it has to be planar, conjugated, and it needs to follow the Huckel's law, which is 4n plus 2 equals the number of electrons in pi bonds. Now let's go through all of these conditions one at a time. So the first condition for a molecule to be aromatic is that it has to be cyclic. In other words, it has to be a ring structure. So let's go over a few examples. This is a cyclopropane. Another example is cyclobutane. In addition to being cyclic, aromatic molecules also have to be planar. In other words, they have to be flat. So you want to look out for bonds that have certain geometries. One type of bond that you want to look for, one type of geometry, is trigonal planar. And I'll give you an example of a molecule that has this geometry. Let's look at CH2. Oh, so we have our central carbon connected to two hydrogens and an oxygen with a pi bond. These are our sigma bonds. Here we have our pi bond. And the angle between each bond is 120 degrees. And this molecule is planar. So similarly, for your aromatic molecule, the molecule has to be flat. Now, the third condition is that the molecule has to be conjugated. And the way I like to think about it is that I look for alternating pi bonds. And you're probably thinking, what does that even mean? So I'm going to just give an example so you can see it as well. Double bond, single bond, double bond. This has conjugation. And the reason is because it has resonance and that allows for an increased stability. So that's what you're looking for in your molecule. You're looking for alternating pi bonds that allow for resonance for an increased stability for your molecule. So I'm just going to show one resonance structure. And as you can see, because there's resonance, there's increased stability. So that's the third condition. The fourth and the last condition is the Huckel's law. And this is very important. Even if it match, um, the molecule matches the other three conditions, it has to match this law. It has to follow this law. So I'm just going to define this law here. So it's 4n plus 2 equals the number of electrons in pi bonds. And n has to equal 0 or a whole integer. And I'm emphasizing whole number. So let's start with an example. We have a benzene ring. So how many electrons are in our pi bond? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 4n plus 2 has to equal 6. And when we solve for n, it has to be 0 or a whole number. So I'm just going to show the algebra here. So here, in this case, n equals 1. So this molecule, according to the Huckel's law, is aromatic. But don't forget to look at the other three conditions as well. So let's just do that quickly. The first condition was that it has to be cyclic, which is there. The second condition is that it has to be planar. If you look at all of the bonds, they are all trigonal planar bonds. Therefore, the second condition is met as well. The third condition is that it has to be conjugated. And the way I explained it, I look for alternating pi bonds. So you can see how it's alternating. Therefore, 
it meets the third condition as well. So this molecule is actually aromatic. All right, now that we've gone all over nonpolar, polar, how it's charged, not charged, and aromatic, it's time to finally see the 20 different R groups. So here is a list of all of the nonpolar amino acids. I just wanted to give you an idea of what you're required to memorize. So you can see for each amino acid, I have the structure drawn, then the one letter code, the three letter code, and then the name of the amino acid. One way that I like to memorize amino acids is by kind of having a number count of how many of each there are. For nonpolar, there are nine amino acids that fall in the category. But out of the nine, two that are here written in red are actually aromatic. The other seven are not. Something else that helped me memorize amino acids was focusing on the exceptions. So the amino acids that are different from the other amino acids. Let's start by focusing on the structure of an amino acid. So we can see that this carbon has four different groups attached to it. As long as the R group is not an amine, a hydrogen or a carboxylic group. And what that tells us that all amino acids are chiral except glycine and they are an S configuration and the exception to this is cysteine. The first exception that we went over is glycine and it's an exception because unlike other amino acids glycine is not chiral and the reason is the R group is a hydrogen in order for a carbon to be chiral, in order for the molecule to be chiral, the carbon atom has to have four different groups attached. In this case, we have two hydrogens. The R group is not different from what's already attached. Therefore, it is not chiral. When memorizing amino acids, you also need to know the one letter code and the three letter code, in addition to the structure and the name of the amino acid. So, glycine is a nonpolar amino acid. I'm just going to write NP next to it. It is not aromatic. The one letter code is just the first letter of the name, and the three letter code is the first three letters of the name. The second exception that we discussed is cysteine and the reason is because the R group which I'm going to put in here has a thiol group and thiols hold more priority than the carboxylic group. Therefore when it comes to labeling configuration cysteine is R configuration whereas all other amino acids are an S configuration. Cysteine is a polar amino acid and it is also not aromatic. Now for the one letter code, again, it's just the first letter of the name. So it's C and the three letter code is the first three letters of the name, CYS. Now that you've been introduced to the two exceptions to the other amino acids, glycine and cysteine, I'm going to start going over little tricks that I use to memorize amino acids. So let's start with nonpolar amino acids. The first one we've gone over, which was just a hydrogen. From here on, I will not be drawing the entire structure of the amino acid because I just want you to focus on the R groups. So this we've already seen, this is glycine, G, G, L, Y. The next one I think is simple, but a step up from glycine. It's a methyl group. This is called alanine. And I always think A, first letter of the alphabet, and it's simple. It's just something that helps me memorize. Now, another cool thing about nonpolar amino acids is that for all of them, the one letter code is the same as the first letter of the name. So for glycine, the one letter code was G. Again, the first letter of the name. The three letter code for alanine is A-L-A. -A. Now, the next one is 
really and i'm telling the name first because really kind of reminds me of its structure i think of an upside down v so it's like a step up from alanine you have that methyl group and then you draw an upside down v introducing two more methyl groups and then again like i said before the one letter code is the same as the first letter and then the three letter code is val the next one is like whaling but with an extra carbon so you'll see what i mean when i draw it do you see the similarity so it's the three carbons that you see here with an extra carbon and this amino acid is called leucine again what i said before the first letter and the three letter code is l-e-u for the next amino acid it is very similar to leucine except the methyl group is rearranged so instead of this methyl being here it's over here and this amino acid is called isoleucine i think of it almost like a derivative of leucine because it's very similar but not the same and something different about isoleucine is unlike the other amino acids for nonpolars that we've gone over the three letter code is not the same as the first three letters of the name it's i l e so we've gone over five of the nine nonpolar amino acids. The next one I'm going to bring your attention to is phenylalanine. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's alanine, which was just a methyl group. So this is alanine. And phenylalanine is alanine plus a phenyl group. And the one letter code for phenylalanine is F, which is different, but pH make the f sound so that's a good way to remember the one letter code that it's f and this is non-polar but the interesting about this is that it is aromatic do not forget that and the three letter code for phenylalanine is again the first three letters of the name so just phe so we've seen six of the nine non-polar amino acids already and i'm gonna bring your attention to now the last three and they're a little different from the six that we've already seen and we'll go over how so the first one we're going to be going over is methionine and i'm going to draw the structure here so now it's different because it is one of the only two amino acids that have a sulfur group the first one we saw before this was cysteine, which was one of the exceptions that we went over. Now, methionine has M as its one letter code, MET as its three letter code. One letter code is the first letter of the name, and the three letter code is the first three letters of the name. The second last one that we're going to go over is proline, and it's different from the others because I'm going to have to draw the entire structure of an amino acid in order to show you what the R group looks like. So as you can remember, from the backbone, we have our central carbon connected to the carboxylic group, the amine group, and then the R group. But proline is different from other amino acids because it circles around and bonds with the amine group that's part of the backbone of every amino acid. Again, this is proline, the one letter code, is just the first letter which is p and the three letter code is pro again the first three letters now the last one that we're going to go over is actually aromatic i'm just going to draw the structure here the name of this amino acid is tryptophan and the one letter code is w so it's not the first letter of the name. It's one of the unique ones. Let's just go on to the three letter code, which is TRP. All right, next up are the polar not charged amino acids. And I like to memorize them kind of in pairs. So first I'm gonna introduce my first pair, which is serine and threonine. I'm just gonna go over the codes again. It's S and S-E-R. So just the first letter, the first three letters, same thing for this one, it's T and then THR. Now, the reason I pair them is because these two have 
an alcohol group in them. So I'm going to draw the structure here. One carbon and then our alcohol group. And for this one, it's one carbon and then alcohol group, except it has an additional methyl group. The next pair, you've seen both of them, but I just like to remember it this way because these are the only two amino acids that have a sulfur group. So the one that we already talked about is methionine, and I'm just going to draw it out here again. So that's methionine. And then the second one, which was an exception that we discussed, is cysteine. So I like to remember these two together because this has a thiol group, this has a diethyl sulfur group. Both of them are the only two amino acids that have sulfur in them. So the last pair that we went over had an alcohol group. These two are the only two amino acids that have sulfur in them. The last pair for the not charged polar groups, I'm going to draw the structure first so you can see why I paired these together. And the reason is because they have the same functional groups. They have amide, but this amino acid has an extra carbon. One good way to remember the names is, so the first one is asparagine. And the second one is glutamine. And this helps me memorize because A is the first alphabet. It has less carbons. And then G comes after A and it has an extra carbon. And another thing is that glutamine has amine in it. And then the I and E, these names kind of remind me of an amine group. And I don't want you to confuse that with an amide. But I just think of nitrogen anytime I see the ending. So that's another way to remember it. Now, their one letter codes are also um, a little different than what you're used to. It's N and Q. And the best way that I could have thought of remembering this was that N comes before Q just like A comes before G. And the three letter codes are ASN and GLN. And then again, this has nitrogen. Both of them have nitrogen. That's why they end in nitrogen. So they just take the first two letters of the name and add an N at the end. Our very last amino acid that we're going to go over looks a lot like phenylalanine. So this is alanine. This is phenylalanine. And then when you add an alcohol group, it is tyrosine. Now I want you to take a moment, which other two amino acids out of the 20 had an alcohol group? Just to remind you, it's serine and threonine. So these three are the only amino acids that have an alcohol group attached. Tyrosine is aromatic. These are not. Just to remind you, tyrosine, the one letter code, is actually Y because the one letter code T is already used for threonine. And Y comes from the second letter of tyrosine. And the three letter code is TYR. Now I want you to remember tryptophan, which was one of the last three nonpolar amino acids that we went over. And you would think that the first three letter of the name would be the three letter code for tryptophan, but it wasn't. The three letter code was actually TRP. And I like to remember this thinking that the scientists didn't want you to confuse it with tyrosine. So instead, they just skipped the Y and used the P. Now, keeping this pair in mind, this can help us memorize the two negatively charged polar amino acids because they have the same structure but instead of an amide they have carboxylic group which is deprotonated so i'm just going to draw the structure in right here and i hope you guys can see the similarity instead of having a nitrogen it has a negatively charged oxygen so instead of an amide group, you have a deprotonated carboxylic group, and that's where the charge comes from, the negative charge. And the names for these amino acids are also very similar. 
So for the amide amino acid, it's asparagine. For the deprotonated carboxylic group, it's aspartate. And the eight ending is usually used when labeling carboxylate groups, so deprotonated carboxylic acids. The second amino acid that's negatively charged is glutamate. Again, I want you to notice the ending, which represents a carboxylate. Now, the one letter code for these two amino acids is D and E. Same thing, A comes before G, D comes before E. And the three letter codes are just the first three letters of the name. So I like to memorize these four all together. These are not charged and these are negatively charged. So these are the structures for the positively charged amino acids. And in my opinion, these three are the hardest to memorize. Everyone has different opinions. But in order to memorize these threes, I really used index cards when I was studying. So I would recommend the same or come up with another way to memorize it. But let me just go over the name for each. So the first one that's drawn here is arginine. And as we already know, that A is already used as the first letter code for alanine. So the second letter of the name is the first letter code, which is R. And then the three letter code is just the first three letters of the name, A-R-G. The second amino acid is lysine. Again, we know that L was used as the first letter code for leucine, a nonpolar amino acid. So I guess the scientists just went in order and instead of L, used K. And the three letter code is just LYS, the first three letters of the name. The last one that we're looking at here is histidine. Luckily enough, H has not been used for any other amino acid, so it's just the first letter of the name, and the three-letter code is just the first three letters of the name. So we've gone over the structure of all 20 amino acids already, but I just wanted to draw out the aromatic um, amino acids all together because I feel like I haven't done that. So I want you to guess what this is before I put the name on. Cover this. It's alanine. Add the phenyl group, it's phenylalanine. Again, pH reminds you of F, and then the three-letter code is just PHE. The second one is phenylalanine with a alcohol group. And the name of this amino acid is tyrosine. The one-letter code is Y, and the three-letter code is just TYR, the three letters of the name. And lastly is tryptophan. And the cool thing about tryptophan, which I didn't mention earlier, this right here is endol. So it's an endol attached by another carbon connecting to the um, amino acid backbone. And the name of this is tryptophan, which also has a different one letter code, which is just W. Again, I don't know how they came up with that, but they couldn't use T, they couldn't use R, they couldn't use Y. They couldn't use P, so I guess they just came up with whatever wasn't used. And the three-letter code is TRP because they didn't want you to confuse it with the three-letter code for tyrosine. So these are all of the aromatic amino acids. I just wanted to draw them out for you guys to see them all together once. All right, now that we've gone over all 20 amino acids, I want us to bring our attention to how these amino acids are synthesized in our body. So out of the 20, nine are actually obtained from our diet because adequate amounts can't be synthesized in our body. These nine are called essential amino acids and the other 11 are called non-essential because our body is actually able to produce them. It all starts with glucose being phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, which could enter glycolysis or pentose phosphate pathway. For the pentose phosphate pathway, glucose 6-phosphate becomes ribose 5-phosphate through multiple steps and is able to produce histidine and serine. It's not drawn here, but serine can also lead to the synthesis of cysteine and glycine. For glycolysis, Glucose becomes pyruvate in 10 steps. 
3-phosphoglycerate is the product of the seventh step, which is able to enter the pentose phosphate pathway by becoming erythrose 4 phosphate. Phosphophenol pyruvate is the product of the ninth step. Both erythrose 4 phosphate and phosphophenol pyruvate um, lead to the synthesis of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Pyruvate, the final product of glycolysis, leads to the synthesis of valine, leucine, alanine, and isoleucine. Pyruvate has three different fates. One of them is entering the citric acid cycle as shown here. Pyruvate becomes citrate, then alpha-glutarate through multiple reactions, and this leads to the synthesis of glutamate, which then leads to the synthesis of glutamine, proline, and arginine. Similarly, alpha-glutarate becomes oxaloacetate through multiple reactions, which leads to synthesis of aspartate and then can lead to synthesis of asparagine, methionine, threonine, and lysine. So now we've seen how all 20 amino acids are synthesized. They're just synthesized in different quantities, making some essential compared to others which are non-essential. So we just went over how amino acids are synthesized in our body, but I also wanted to bring your attention to how amino acids could be synthesized in lab. So there are two reactions that you should know is Gabriel's and the second one is Strecker's. So the first one is Gabriel's reaction and I'm going to go over the reagents that are used so you're able to recognize them. So the first one that you need to know is potassium phthalamide. I'm going to draw it out here. So this is potassium phthalamide. Plus diethyl bromomalonate. And this is multiple reactions. So you need a strong base. You need a halogen with the R group that you want your amino acid to have. And then lastly, you're going to need water and heat for hydrolysis and decarboxylation. And this gives us our amino acid. All right. So, I wanted to briefly go over the mechanism of how this reaction occurs, and the first part requires an SN2 reaction to occur. And the way it occurs is the nucleophilic nitrogen attacks our extremely electrophilic alpha carbon in order to push off the bromine, the leaving group, and give us our intermediate. And this intermediate is called n phthalamidyl melanic ester, and that comes from the phthalamide nitrogen being attached to the melanic ester. In the next part of the reaction, this hydrogen right here is deprotonated by a base. So this intermediate becomes nucleophilic and is able to kick off this halogen in order to attach itself to the R group. And this R group is what we want our amino acid to have. And this results in the R group being attached. I'm just going to draw the next intermediate here. The last part of the reaction requires the addition of water for hydrolysis and the addition of heat for decarboxylation. With water addition, we get this intermediate and what I want you to notice here is that we have our R group attached which we want for the amino acid we have our amine group which was initially being protected by this part of the molecule from our intermediate which is now removed with hydrolysis the ethyl groups have been removed with the hydrolysis and now we actually have our exposed carboxylic groups and the next step is the addition of heat in order to remove this carboxylic acid the co2 which ends up giving us our amino acid which i'm just going to draw here
So just to backtrack, our nitrogen came from the potassium phthalamide, our central carbon, our alpha carbon, was the extremely electrophilic carbon in our diethyl bromomalonate. Our R group came from the halogen alkylation that we did over here through an NSN2 reaction. And our carboxylic group is also achieved from our malonate. So this was the first reaction of how to synthesize amino acids. The second reaction is the Strucker's reaction, and it begins with an aldehyde, which is attached to the R group that we want on our amino acid. The first part requires the addition of ammonia and HCl. The second part requires the addition of HCN, aqueous. And the third part requires water for hydrolysis, and you'll see why. And this gives us our amino acid. The first part of the reaction requires the addition of HCl, an acid, and ammonia, NH3, which I want you to remember has a lone pair and it can act as a nucleophile to attack our electrophilic carbon once it has um, once the oxygen has been protonated after going through multiple steps we get a amine where we have our nitrogen double bonded to a carbon and positively charged with two hydrogens The second part of the reaction requires the addition of aqueous HCN and that gives us negatively charged CN in our solution which is able to attack again our electrophilic carbon and gives us an intermediate with a nitrile group attached. In the last part water is added in order to hydrolyze the nitrile group. I'm just going to write that here to give us our final product, which is our amino acid. The nitrile, once hydrolyzed, give us, gives us the carboxylic group. And our amine here, due to the acidic conditions, becomes positively charged. So this is the end of our video. Thank you for watching. If you have any feedback, any topics you want to see in future videos, please let me know through the comments below. All feedback is appreciated. And don't forget to like and subscribe.